Mike Ugenet, I hope you're doing well. Welcome back to Tuscaloosa. Oh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Mike, we're in a deep conversation here in Tuscaloosa, local local conversation of how we recognize Nick Saban's accomplishments by giving him, you know, a salute, naming a street after him. And, and we've been throwing up this, uh, Saban Field at Bryant Diddy Stadium. You like it or you don't like it? What do you tell yeah, us? Why, why not? Um, you know, I know there, there's statues of him up, um, and, and those are obviously thing, things of permanence. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think a, 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 a road is one thing, a, st- a statue is one thing. But, yeah, putting his name on the field somehow, uh, I, I think is worthy. I, I know Bear Bryant is uh, e- extremely revered in the state of Alabama. Um, I think what Nick Saban has done uh, while he's been coached at Alabama trumps what Saban has, uh, trumps what uh, Bryant did because th- this is a vastly different era of college football. Uh, much more money being spent by many more universities. It- it's a lot harder to win these days than it, than it was in the 60s and 70s. We're talking to Mike Ugenen right now, gridironnow.com. We're going to work our way to the conversations, but we've been throwing it around because. You know, you don't have to wait till somebody retires to exactly. salute them. Exactly, and I think that's what what too many what too many people do. Um, now, with, you know, I, I frankly don't think Saban cares either way. I think he's got uh, he's much more focused on, on his players and his team. But you're you're right. I mean, naming it Nick Saban Field while he still is the coach would be an incredible honor. And it would probably help recruiting a little bit, too. I mean, you know, get that recognition. Obviously, we don't know how much, how many years is left. But uh, going into spring practice, you've written an article, Secondary Issues Are Primary Problems for Alabama, Florida, and LSU. Let's center around Alabama. Uh, it does seem to be a lot of questions around who's going to fill the different voids that have departed to the National Football League here in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, Alabama lost its top six defensive backs. That's an incredible amount of talent out the door. Uh, you can't adequately replace Minka Fitzpatrick. Uh, I think they're going to have a lot of problems replacing Ronnie Harrison because uh, I think Harrison was too often overshadowed because he was in the same secondary as Minka Fitzpatrick. Uh, Anthony Averett played well for the last two or three years of his career. Levi Wallace came on. Tony Brown was a, a nice complimentary player. And Hootie Jones had a really good senior season. So that's six guys that are going to be extremely difficult to replace. Now, obviously – Alabama's got talent. Deontay Thompson started the two college football playoff games. Uh, I, I think he's a for sure starter. Um, and Alabama has recruited well in the secondary. I think Patrick Sertain Jr., if he's as good as the analysts say, he's going to start this fall. But, again, it's it's one thing to be talented. Um, it's It's a whole different level to be talented and experienced. And I think that's where the concern for Saban – uh, and and Lapoy and the new defensive secondary coach uh, Carl Scott is got to be yes we have talented guys but they haven't all played that much uh, and in Sertain's case obviously he hasn't taken a snap at the college level so I think the front seven of the defense is going to be immensely talented with experienced guys the secondary is going to have talented guys with very little experience. Mike, uh, when you look at Alabama, how much of it is an advantage when you've got a quarterback? like Tua Tungavaloa that can go after those young defensive backs and you can expose them and understand where their weakness, where they need to improve. Uh, when you look at the other schools, LSU's up in the air about quarterbacks. I don't know what the situation there is in Florida, but it seems like that Alabama's got a quarterback that can attack this young secondary in practice and expose them before they get to game time. Yeah, I, that, that's an interesting point because I, I would imagine that if you're the Alabama offensive coaches, uh, and the Alabama defensive coaches, there's going to be a lot of one versus ones in spring practice. And, and you're right. If I'm uh, an Alabama defensive coach, I'm telling the offensive guys, attack us, take advantage of our weaknesses, or else we're not going to get better. Um, th- there is an advantage. I think Alabama opens with Louisville. Obviously, Lamar Jackson's gone, which is a gigantic positive. But you still got Petrino as the play caller. So you know Louisville's going to have some different looks. Uh, it's first game. So, yeah, if, if I'm an Alabama defensive coach, uh, I want the offense to attack me um, every day in spring ball. Uh, I want Deontay Thompson to get better. Um, I want uh, Daniel Wright to get better. I want those corners to see guys um, playing at their hardest and, and doing stuff to try to take advantage of me. Um, 
because I think that's going to help Alabama improve. You're right, LSU and Florida, they're worried about finding a starting quarterback. Um, they're not worried about taking, you know, hey, let's let's take some shots against that secondary. No, the the the, the, the modus operandi in, in Baton Rouge and Gainesville is let's find a guy who can do things. Um, they're not worried about, hey, look, can can our quarterback test our untested secondary? They have far more important things to worry about in finding a quarterback who can play. Mike, who's the second best coach in the SEC when you look at it from your perspective? Who is the second best well, coach? Well, yeah, last year I thought it was Mullen in Mississippi State because what he had done in Mississippi State. No, they hadn't won any conference titles. They hadn't even won a division title. But he made them nationally relevant. And if you make Mississippi State nationally relevant in football, you're doing something. Um, and obviously now at Florida he has a much bigger palette uh, to paint on. Um, because you can win national titles in Florida. You, you ain't winning national titles in Starkville. Um, what Kirby Smart did last year was impressive. His second year on the job at Georgia, can he carry that over to this season? They're going to be prohibitive favorites to win the East. Can he get it done? Um, but two years, I would argue, is not uh, enough time to fully gauge Kirby Smart yet. Um, so, yeah, I think – and Jimbo Fisher – Coming into the league, Fisher has a national title on his resume. Um, quarterback whisperer of sorts. Um, tremendous recruiter at Florida State. I think he's going to be a tremendous recruiter at Texas A&M. Um, so I think the uh, Florida's got a much better coach now than it did. Texas A&M's got a much better coach now than it did. Tennessee, I think, w- will be proven to have a much better coach than it did. Um, I-, I think it's the SEC ha- has gotten tougher this offseason because of the coaching changes. Um, Kirby Smart, let, let's see how good he is. Again, two years is not enough time to fully gauge him, but I, I still think right now Mullen's the second-best coach in the SEC. Let, let's go to Dan Mullen. What do you think are reasonable expectations there in Gainesville in year number one? Um, offensive improvement by at least 50 or 60 yards a game, uh, getting to a bowl game, uh, and playing better against FSU and Georgia. Um, now, two years ago, Jim McElwain beat Georgia um, in Kirby Smart's first season. Last year, they got beat 42-7. to um, McElwain never beat FSU, never came close to beating FSU. That gap has to narrow. Um, but, again, getting to a bowl game is, is a must, as is offensive improvement. I don't expect – I don't think anybody thinks Florida is going to average 450 yards a game like they did when Mullen was the O.C., but you can't be at, you can't be Florida and average 330 yards a game either. You need you need to flirt with the 400 yard mark uh, and show definite improvement on offense. Mike, uh, let me ask you about basketball here for a couple of minutes. This league has made a dedication on the side of the coaches to bring in some elite coaches. A few years ago, it looks like it's paying off for the SEC and this NCAA basketball, or will pay off, obviously with eight teams going dancing. Yeah, I think th- there is no easy game in the SEC this, this this basketball season. You look at Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt beat TCU. TCU's a sixth seed. Um, and Vanderbilt and Ole Miss were the worst teams in the league. You, it, those were not gimme wins. Football, frankly, the last couple of years has had easy. Yes, we know we're playing this team. We know we are going to beat them. The basketball coaches in the SEC the last couple of years have been better than the football coaches. Um, I think the tide may be turning – a little bit with with this off season, with the off season hires uh, that, that the SEC made in, in football, but right now this is yeah the last couple of years this has been a better basketball league uh, than football league because the coaches were better. The players, football wise, are still better than any other league. That will be shown in the draft yet again. But I would argue that the coaches coaching those guys the last couple of years in football haven't been as good as they needed to be. Um, it was a concerted effort in, in basketball. Um, they ramped up the non-conference scheduling. Schools are spending more money on basketball facilities, new arenas, uh, and they're spending more money on basketball salaries. Um, and, and they're getting a return on it. Now it's time to get a return on what the schools are spending on football. Um, and if that doesn't happen, um, you're, you're going to see more seasons like last year in the SEC where there were three really high-level teams and the rest of the league was, frankly, pretty much garbage. Mike, talk about gridironnow.com and the website you guys are able to create. Uh, I know you guys started this a few years ago, but it's obviously picked up a lot of traction. 
very popular run uh, among the SEC fans. You guys have got a lot of content there. Talk about gridironnow.com. Yeah, it's obviously an SEC-centric site. Um, we do have a lot of Florida State coverage as well. But, um, yeah, th- th- this is an interesting time of the year because you have – this is going to be – we have spring practice previews up, um, and we'll, ha- we'll continue to add more. But this is, I would argue, an extremely interesting off season in the SEC, more interesting than usual because of the new coaches, um, because of the quarterback situation. I thought last year – the SEC was going to get good quarterback play. It did not. Um, will this year be any different? And the, the, the added attraction this year is you have your defending national champion with a quarterback controversy. So, um, th- yeah, this is going to be an interesting offseason. We're, we're covering that in depth. Um, but, yeah, if, if you every SEC fan has their favorite team website. We like to think of uh, ourselves as, okay, go read your favorite team site and then come to our site for a better overview of the league as a whole.